the nature of warfare in eastern Ukraine has changed constantly. In the summer of 2014, the war was maneuverable. By winter, it had turned into a fierce positional confrontation with massive use of artillery. By the end of 2015, as a result of a number of peace initiatives, the degree of confrontation had fallen and some heavy equipment was withdrawn to the rear, but peace was not restored. None of the parties achieved their goals, the Kremlin did not get an inland corridor to Crimea, and the Ukrainian authorities were also unable to please their citizens with a victory. And despite the fact that the plan to create Novorossiya had actually failed, Russia did not leave eastern Ukraine. The war is not over. A large-scale special operation took place in Krasnohorivka on December 10, during which officers of the Security Service of Ukraine detained 85 people suspected of involvement in the activities of gangs of the Donetsk People's Republic and Luhansk People's Republic. It came to about 600 members of security, defense and law enforcement agencies in total. You're watching the 75th episode of the film History of the War. In 2014, the Russian Federation committed an act of armed aggression against Ukraine. The war has gone on for several years now. We investigate the course of this war hot on its trail, tracing the links between military operations, diplomacy, politics and economics. We try to understand how it came about and the main thing – the reason for the war. At the same time, as is traditional, the suburbs of Horlivka and Donetsk became the hot spots on the demarcation line in the ATO zone. In the area of the village of Zaitseva, a mortar was used for a short time, while in the village of Piski, a shooting battle lasted the whole day without a break. In the area of Starohnatyvka Hranitne, Russian-backed militants used infantry fighting vehicles, grenade launchers and small arms. The village of Shirokina was shot three times. At the same time, Luhansk region came under fire from a grenade launcher just once. And it's quite easy to explain such peacefulness on the part of Luhansk People's Republic militants. In conditions of positional warfare, most shelling is carried out with one goal in mind – to weaken the enemy's positions, block supply, inflict human losses and losses in equipment, and force enemy soldiers to leave their fortifications. Not having the possibility to move forward, both sides conducted exclusively defensive actions, which ultimately led to the real observance of the ceasefire. Besides, the situation in Priazovia, namely the region around the Sea of Azov, was diametrically opposed. Vast spaces devoid of residential development enabled the militants to maneuver actively. Avoiding meetings with OSCE observers, often operating at night, Russian-backed militants actively used heavy weapons, despite declarations and agreements. It is logical that such behavior provoked the Ukrainian side to give an adequate response, which meant that artillery was quite often used. On December 11th, the ceasefire was observed in Luhansk region for the entire day. But the situation was quite different in Donetsk region. On the Svitlodarsk Arc, in the areas around Piski, Opitne and Avdiivka, Russian-backed terrorists not only harassed but carried out targeted attacks. The ceasefire was also violated twice near Shirokina. 
As a result of these attacks, two Ukrainian soldiers were wounded, and one soldier of the 93rd Brigade Oleh Habarak was killed. On the same day, Roman Kapatsi, a soldier of the 28th Brigade, failed to regain consciousness and died in hospital in Dnipro from wounds he'd received as a result of being tortured in captivity. The situation in the anti-terrorist operation zone remained tense the next day. With strict observance of the ceasefire in Luhansk region, Russian-backed militants of the Donetsk People's Republic used heavy 120mm caliber mortars to fire 20 times at Ukrainian positions in Luhansk region. The situation was similar in the afternoon, but not limited only to small arms, as around Krasnohorivka, Russian-backed militants fired at Ukrainian military positions using onboard weapons of infantry fighting vehicles. In the area around the village of Zaitseva, shelling from a 82mm caliber mortar was spotted, while in the area of Hronitne, in addition to the standard set of machine guns, grenade launchers and mortars, Russian-backed militants also fired from a tank. Here we should note peculiar love on the part of Kremlin strategists of various memorable dates. An increase in the threat from Russian-backed militants was noted on the New Year's Eve. So, in the first 10 days of December alone, law enforcement officers stopped several dozen attempts to transport weapons to civilian territory. Within 10 days, they confiscated 140 grenades and shells, 3,000 cartridges of various types, and over 6 kilograms of explosives. Among other things, on December 12, 2015, an assassination attempt was made on the leader of local Russian bet militants Pavel Dremov on the highway between Pervomaisk and Kadiivka, old name Stahanov. As a result of his car being blown up, the latter died on the spot, while his driver was thrown out of the car by the blast wave, though he too died later on the way to hospital. The so-called government of the Luhansk People's Republic announced a reward for the killer's capture. The version was put forward of the involvement of a Ukrainian sabotage group in the incident. Dromov, who was in a conflict with the leader of Russian-backed militants of Luhansk People's Republic, Plotnitsky, over illegal business dealings, became a banal victim of criminal showdowns. On December 13th, militants observed the Luhansk People's Republic no-firing regime, and their Donetsk accomplices reduced the intensity of firing. Krasnohorivka became the epicenter of hostilities, where the Russian-backed militants used mortars to fire at Ukrainian positions for 30 minutes. In the area around Zaitseva Mayorsk, in addition to the constant use of small arms, one incident of mortar shelling was also spotted. Besides, a sniper spent the whole day firing at Ukrainian positions. All these actions resulted in the wounding of two Ukrainian soldiers. As a result of return fire by Ukrainian troops, two Russian-backed militants were wounded and one was killed. On December 14th, for the first time in several days, the military situation was aggravated in Luhansk region, in the area of Trohizmenka. Terrorists fired at Ukrainian positions using grenade launchers and machine guns. There was a fall in the number of shelling attacks in Donetsk region, but this ceasefire was not observed. The militants used small arms to fire at Ukrainian positions in Piski, Avdiivka, Luhansk and Zaitseve. At the same time, not a single violation of the ceasefire was observed in the vicinity of the city of Mariupol. However, in Volnavacha area, while living occupied territory, a local resident was blown up by a mine and died as a result, despite the efforts of doctors to save his life. A reminder that 26 civilians were killed on mine explosions in Donetsk region in 2015. On December 15th, the principal deputy chief monitor of the OSCE special monitoring mission to Ukraine, Alexander Hook, announced that both sides of the conflict had handed over withdrawn weapons to OSCE observers. On the same day, the city authorities of Donetsk announced that the curfew in the city would be lifted on New Year's Eve. A reminder that restrictions on moving around the city at nighttime were introduced by Russian-backed militants in spring 2014. 
This paralyzed all nightlife in the modern million population city. Private business suffered most of all, since in addition to the cessation of the work of stores and pharmacies, it influenced the public transport schedule and the duration of the working day as a whole. Put simply, anyone who stayed late at work to finish urgent business could easily be captured by Russian-backed militants. At the same time, the absence of people on the streets helped militants to move military equipment around the city and fire directly from city squares. On December 15th, the overall picture of the confrontation in Donbass had not changed. Russian-backed militants were active in the Svitlodarsk Ark, but at the same time they strictly adhered to the ceasefire in around Luhansk. In the area of Pavlopil, a Secret Service agent of 131st Battalion was killed by a sniper, but this episode was actually the only case of targeted fire. At the same time, the western outskirts of Donetsk, Pisky and Avdiivka remained zones of constant tension and provocation. On the same day, the Minsk contact group agreed on a complete ceasefire during the New Year holidays. This information was interpreted by the so-called DPR press secretary Eduard Basurin in his own way. He said that the Ukrainian army would not begin military operations in the Donbass in the near future. At the same time, some field commanders of Russian-backed militants ignored the peace agreements. And while the New Year's truce was observed around Luhansk and Mariupol, the permanent sniper war continued in Donetsk region. On the Svitlodarsk Ark, as well as in the vicinity of Horlivka, militants carried out several provocative attacks, which in the main lasted no more than 15 minutes. At the same time, in the area of the village of Piski, a battle using small arms continued throughout the day and did not end in the night, which resulted in the wounding of two Ukrainian soldiers. On the same day, Ukrainian border guards detained a militant in Luhansk region who was trying to cross the Russian-Ukrainian border illegally in the village of Milove. The detainee turned out to be an artillery man from a gang of the Luhansk People's Republic. A large cache of various weapons was also found in an abandoned storage facility in the village of Nova Aydar, Luhansk region. A single case of firing at Ukrainian positions was observed in the area around Turkey's Binka. Everything was much more complicated around Donetsk. Militants used 82mm caliber mortars in the area of Marinka, Krasnohorivka and Luhansk on the Svitlodarsk Ark. In the latter case, observers spotted the operations of a sniper and a sabotage reconnaissance group who wanted to cross the border. A similar situation was encountered in the area of Horlivka. Note that in all these cases the militants used small arms. Barrel artillery and tanks were not used. Despite the latest Minsk agreement, Ukrainian positions near Novhorodsky and Novoselivka came under fire. There were continuous skirmishes in Pisky and at the Ukrainian outpost located at the Butivka mine. And it should be noted that in most cases it was not targeted fire, it was done to provoke return fire. The militants fired at sites that were previously safe for civilians. The militants suffered losses, with at least one dead and up to ten wounded. The second day of the New Year's truce cost Ukraine four wounded soldiers, but there were no human losses. After a long enough break, flights of Russian unmanned reconnaissance aircraft were observed in the sky over the Crimean Isthmus and eastern Ukraine and over the neutral waters of the Sea of Azov. A Russian Su-24 reconnaissance aircraft was observed by the Air Defense Forces of Ukraine. At his big annual news conference on December 17th, Russian Federation President Vladimir Putin admitted that Russian citizens who are solving certain military issues in Donbass are present there. Мы никогда не говорили, что там нет людей, которые занимаются там определенными решениями определенных вопросов, в том числе в военной сфере. And there was a reason for Putin dodging a direct answer, since the Kremlin was considering the option of another winter offensive.